No, mine um, was uh, a documentary filmmaker who was so narcissistic he actually banned me from writing any notes that he wasn't present for when they got written. You're joking. No. And then he'd sit at the back of my studio and he'd kind of describe what he wanted and then, for, oh, you know, you just try stuff out. And you go, no! <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> and cello up out, no! And he fired me. And uh, then I... He offered me another job, and I took it, and he fired me off that one, too. Oh, joking? Joking. I know who that is. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <what you do. laughs> yeah, it's a weird yeah. feeling being fired. I mean, it's not good to happen to you, but it's happened to me quite a few times. And once you've done it a few times, you kind of just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's not, you're not like, yeah, yeah, whatever, but you're a lot more hardened. I think the first yeah. time it kind of happens is like... Well, I was, saying, I was saying earlier, my big break was because you got fired. Oh, yeah. Oh, was, that was my break. Space. Yeah. <laughs> And space. And there space. we go. Yeah, yeah. So we're all tied by being fired off jobs. Yeah. I think the thing is, you can get like bad people to work with, and I think if you get them too early on, it can be quite soul destroying. It can affect how you view the industry or what you do or how you should work and how you should. And I think you, I was very lucky, and I worked with a lot of quite experimental people early on, who would push me to do things differently, and then that becomes your mindset slightly. So I think. You kind of got to like not let every experience be this as dictates how the industry is. I just finished a job, and I've I regret very little, but I really regret my experience on this one because I'd had so many, I'd had a run of really awful experiences with awful narcissists, and really disappointing things with directors who I'd invested a lot of time with moving on, yeah, and that kind of stuff, which happens. I've now learned. It's kind of myth of directors, you know, taking care of you throughout your life. Well, is I have a good metaphor about that, but carry on. No, yeah. Well, I just, yeah, so I just went through this, and I was so stressed out, I, um, I, I, I tried to walk off the project, and the producer said, listen, you know, we'll just give you a couple of weeks, but you're, if we give you a couple of weeks, you will be cool, won't you? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I did it, and it was Tutankhamun, and I got to the end of it, and it wasn't till the end where I went, that was the best experience I've ever had in my entire career. They were the loveliest people who completely understood what I was up against, knew that it was going to be one round of notes and, and that was it, didn't want to hear what I'd done with their notes, had given me the two weeks off, kept me on board, and had also, I'd been commissioned to do an electronic score and they found 60 grand for me to, to get an orchestra. You know, it was wow, just great. like, but it wasn't until the end yeah. that I went, that was really such a lovely job, but I didn't enjoy it because I was in a, in a bad bad place you know sorry the film i just did was had to be done in like a month and it was a crazy crazy turnaround and the director came over from la and we were just recording and he just sat around the whole time saying this is great i love it and and i the only problem was getting him to shut up when we're doing the mix so we can actually get on with the mixing so we had so much time he just want to chat to everyone and just he had no notes and it was it was amazing it's only when we got to the end like that was amazing how did yeah. that happen I guess you do have to get to the end to be able to reflect back on it, don't you? Yeah, but the director's taking you with them. I think the, the best metaphor for that is it's like, it's a party, right? There's a, the film industry is like a party, right? And the director turns up and they're like, the guy on the door has got his guest list and he goes, uh, oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah, and he comes on the list. And, and he's like, yeah, I've got my mate with me, his composer, Christian or Daniel or whatever. And they're like, no, no, he's not on the list, just got your name on here. Yeah. Yeah. And then the director either goes, ah, shit, sorry you know, not on the list. Or they go, no, no, he's coming in with me. He's with me. He's on the list. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, OK, you can come in. Yeah. And it's where they stand up to that. And then once you get into the party, then you're just hiding in the corner and no one wants to talk to you. And if you're in there for long enough, people just go, oh, yeah, he's a film business guy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of rubbish. I think lots of, I think, actually, one of the things I found about TV, which annoyed, I mean, it did me very well, but I was always shocked at how little I don't want to say risk taking people had, but in terms of people always want to play safe. So I got loads of work because I'd done work with other people and they were like, oh yeah, Dan will do it. He gets it delivered on time. It's kind of easy to get on with. Um, hopefully it was because the work was good as well, but I kind of think a lot of it was just because I was easy to get on with and you'd get it done and they knew it wasn't a problem. And I, I try to get other people work sometimes, like friends. I'd be like, you've got to hire this guy, he's great. And it was hard. They wouldn't hire people. And there was a sort of, in a, I don't want to say laziness, but there's a kind of people, I mean, if, I get it, if you're, if you're running a TV, you know, you're making a TV show, you've got a million things to think about. Obviously, we all think music's the most important thing, but, you know, you 
they're thinking about a million things, they just go, oh, that guy, oh, fine, yeah, he's done stuff but before. A sa- but a safe pair of hands is, for them, is a lot of times the be-all and end-all at the end of the day, because so, it's just it's something they don't have to worry about. That's and, the problem. And do you think that, that, that applies to TV more because it, it, the producers really have the, the sway above directors, more so than in film? I think, especially in TV now, I think, I mean, I'm not doing so much TV stuff now, but yeah. I think TV has become more and more producer-led and... You know, you don't get, A, you don't really get one-off dramas very much anymore. They're like big <coughs> engine, you know, like 10 parts. Yeah. Documentary has gone from being interesting, like one-off films, to massive things, 10-part series about selling a cooker or something. And they don't really care about things in the same way. So you don't have the same visionaries who are pushing their own, you know, their own kind of idiosyncratic visions. Yeah. You're kind of getting these more committee-led stuff. Um, which sounds very negative. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but what am I trying to say that's going to be positive? Uh, um, but I was surprised at how few people hunted me down for my music. And it was more kind of like, oh, you've worked with so-and-so, you're good. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're easy to get on with. So the weird thing is, if you get in the door when you're trying to do stuff, as long as you're kind of reliable, easy to get on with, and get stuff done, then you kind of keep getting work after a while. I think when I started off, I was probably a bit more of a prima donna. Um, I think it's important to have a sense of like your worth as an artist. Wasn't there a major broadcaster you didn't work for for about 10 years? Yeah, that's because... That's me. Cheers, mate. No, yeah, that was my first thing I got thrown off of. And uh, yeah, I wrote them a 4,000 word letter telling them I thought they were a bunch of... Yeah. This is this is on my this, this is, I'm making a list of things you shouldn't do. Um, and one of them. Can I say, cheers, Dan. You, know, <laughs> you made my career. Things you shouldn't do in this career is always wait till late at night after you've had several glasses of wine to respond to that difficult email. That way, we'll, you'll have time to make sure your response is re- a really long one. Yeah. It's, yeah it's, the other thing is when you get certain notes to, and if you're, I think people don't understand as well the effort you can put into stuff, and. You know, you can put this, you can put two seconds of effort in something. You can spend two weeks trying to get something, and they might not. You know, they might. They'll, they'll just look at it as someone who has no understanding often of what you've done in terms of. You might try to do something very unique, and in some ways that's kind of good. They just look at it very primal, like is this good or not? But that's where it's really harsh when you put loads of effort in and they just kind of bat it away and you do something in two minutes and they go, that's great. And I think the important thing is to keep yourself, if you're like as an artist, to keep wanting to push yourself doing those things that take two weeks to get binned or whatever, because you can get really disheartened and just kind of go, you know what, I'll just always do the two minute thing, the quick thing. And then yeah, the, the frustration is when you, it's when the, at the end of the day you find out that's essentially what they want. That's, that's the difficulty, is the fact that it's when you, you know you can put in the time, you can put in the effort, you can try and go push the boundaries and go somewhere new. And it's when they turn and go, yeah, we really like that. But what we really liked was what you did on the last series we did. And you're there realising that what the last thing you did was uh, literally a you know, kind of one hour turnaround of a five minute piece of music that you just kind of rushed through and it was all, and they're suddenly going, that's what we want. And so the, at that point, you either, make the, you either make that decision to, OK, well, I'm going to kind of reinvent the wheel, and I'm going to go, no, 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 I'm doing this. Or you end up going, OK, if that's what you want. And that's, that's slightly soul-destroying when you know that you're doing it just for their sake rather than yours. Maybe it's also because when you're, like, when you're just watching something and you just come up with it, it's more of an instinct, instinct and it kind of goes with a picture rather when you overthink it and it you could... try to be all creative and fancy and this. <laughs> <laughs> you can always I'll, teach, I'll Oliver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Drama. You're right. Made the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you could be right. Sorry. You, yeah. Don't worry. Put it, put it on the on the bill. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're probably right. You probably are right. But. That's the whole thing about. And there's two things I always say is, 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 is about breaking in, is that there's people really find it difficult to know what is good music. So if you're, if you're you know, flavour of the month or you have a big CV, they yeah. just trust, and you've won a few awards, they trust 
you know what you're doing. But also there is this responsibility of, as a head of department, you know, and if you don't have a, a, a CV, I mean, whilst directors may be really enthusiastic, it is producers who get nervous about yeah. it, wouldn't you say? Yeah. But that, I mean, being flavor of the month, is, I mean, joking aside, we, when we've, never, we've never talked about this, but when the project we were talking about, that was kind of my kind of big break because of, um, of Daniel letting it go, shall we say. <laughs> um, that that was my break, and that was my because I uh, before that I had a CV which was you know a few BBC programs and a few sure. Nature programs, but but nothing major. And then when that came along, the, there was a guy who was kind of fighting for me to get it, and I yeah. did the, the whatever I did to send off, and it was fine. But straight after that, there was a sudden kind of who was this guy, and where's he suddenly come from? Yeah. And I literally was flavor of the month, and it's it's having that assumption that what you have to realise really early on is. You could be flavor of the month literally for the month yeah. or for the next six months or maximum, you know, you kind of have to hang in for the year. And during that period, you have to take every job, every job you get offered because there will be that break and you will be what you perceive to be flavor of the month. And at those stages, for me, I mean, I kind of did whatever they wanted. And in terms of me and my artistic voice and what I wanted to do, that disappeared. And it was suddenly like, <laughs> I'm just going to do this to build up a, yeah, I think a career. Early on as well, it's don't be like, oh, I'm only choosing these projects that are right. Just do Everything. every fucking thing. Because yeah. A, you don't know, you're learning all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're also building up relationships with people. And even if they ditch you when they get to that party with the, the bouncer yeah. on the front, yeah. you'll still have built up a lot of work at that point that's... You know that helps you with other people, and I, I was very lucky. I ended up doing the very first reality shows, uh, which is lucky or not lucky, like Edwardian Country House and Bad Lads Army, mm -hmm. and because UK sort of invented those sort of shows, all the people on those shows would go and work on every other one, like Hell's Kitchen and Love Island and all yeah. these sort of things. So I ended up just working on all those, and that was like a kind of boom thing like that, where because no one knew what they were doing at that point, they just hired the same people from the same shows. Mm -hmm. You get those weird little lucky moments where you just suddenly, and you're right. You should just early on just do, just do everything. Like keep keep assuming that your flavour of the month for that month. Just presume just that right next on. month and it's going to dry up completely. The mistake I made though is I, I always compare it to Hans Zimmer doing. He did Going for Gold, didn't he? he did. And it's a great theme tune, by the way. It's a great theme tune, but had he taken Going for Gold after doing Rain Man, I think that would have damaged his brand. And I yeah. think it's it's knowing when. To, to stop. Yeah. You, yeah, you to told stop. me once, once you have a really good project, don't take on like a really shit well, project yeah, anymore. Because like like my whole career stemmed from the Scale Electrics uh, documentary. So I have literally ta taken everything that's, that's come in the door. Particularly when people ask for you specifically, there's something incredibly flattering about that. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to turn down. But I, what I found is there's been periods in my career where my IMDb page, like the top five things, are just awesome projects and you know, big French movie and a really, you know, highly acclaimed horror and all that kind of stuff. And then I just find, like, six months later, I've totally fucked it with, like, a, a Danny, Danny Dyer vehicle. You know? I had that recently. I did, I did as a favour for a TV company that I really like, uh, who I worked with very early on, gave my first break. They're like, can you do this little title theme for our, our show? And I was like, uh, you know, I'm kind of doing these movie things now. But, yeah, you know what, like... You, you really help, you know, I've got a lot of love for them, they're a great company, really nice. Yeah, sure, sure, I'll do it. I thought it'd be really easy, like, do it in a, you know, in a day. Oh, you know, I don't mind doing it, but I don't want to be credited under my name. I want to be like Studio Pemberton or something I've made yeah. up, so it's not officially me. And, you know, no IMDb or anything like that. Anyway, um, of course, it's on IMDb, so I've got, like, three big movies, and then it says... <laughs> I've <done> music. <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Mind me. That's a good show, isn't it? Yeah, but they just refused to let me use De Jefferson Chambers, which is my um, my my, my re registered PRS pseudonym. Bl black Black American pseudonym. Black Ops. Yeah. <laughs> Jefferson Chambers. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were really insulted when I asked if I could use my pseudonym as well. Oh, well, see yeah. the show. It's one of his right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my normal quality. Yeah. Therefore, <laughs> oh wow. I think if you've done good work, you look at David Bowie. What's interesting is he constantly would do all kinds of nonsense in a way. But if you do some good work that, well not nonsense, but just like, 
he'd just try anything out, right? He didn't care. Just like, I'll try that out. And always experimenting and not worried about, like, oh, I've got to keep this thing very careful. And because he's done so much good work, that just sticks through for a long time. And I think if you do some good work, then that kind of will last a lot longer than average sort of stuff. But then, I don't know, everything changes these days. And but the other thing is, I mean, you know, not wanting to be mercenary about it, a lot of the time, the what we would consider to be more mundane and um, average shows that we do, yeah. normally they're the ones that earn us the money. Let's be honest about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you know what I mean? We ha you kind of have to, there is a certain point where you go, do you know what, we can be as arty farty as we like and do what we want to do and have our voice. But when someone, someone comes to you and offers you a programme where you know that's going to pay for the next extension or that's going to pay for yeah. your next gear. Or you don't know. Or, well, you know. I got offered a um, pub public in information film. And I didn't learn this until doing it. That basically, if they don't sell advertising space, they have to put these public information films in, which is why you get them in the early hours of the morning where it's more difficult to sp uh, mm -hmm. sell advertising space. But it was like, it was the second... The second of one, and the, 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 the first one had won loads of awards and stuff. And I just got really aware that there was this irate composer who did the first one, who was going absolutely mental that he didn't get the second, to the point where lawyers were involved oh, and really? this kind of stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got my first PRS check for the public information film. You know why. That, and it, that is the most um, lucrative thing I've ever done. Was yeah. was uh, you know like like you know be, be aware of fireworks. It was a public information film, so it's actually quite surprising where these things um, yeah. come from. And that's why I think, you know, something that's been quite shocking for me has been working on the British uh, movie industry, which has now been completely dominated by these uh, blockbuster movies. So in the early days, you know, the, 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 the kind of an average British movie would get, get into 300 cinemas and stuff. And now you're talking maybe a, a dozen. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty devastating yeah, because there's absolutely, absolutely no income from it at all. But it is weird with movies because... It is seen as like the holy grail in a way, but TV stuff connects with people way more in a lot of the country. Like, you know, even though I've done some sort of big movies now, most people have never seen them. And, and, but, you know, something like Great British Menu or everyone, you know, that's like beamed into Peep Show. Yeah, all the time. Even Peep Show's not, you know, it's, it's the really mass mainstream stuff. I kind of find it interesting how that has an impact on people's lives in a way they don't know it. I was watching an old Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I don't, I don't watch old episodes of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Just, it, was the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the coffee. I'm going to box set that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was reading some article and it was about the coffee. It was 15 years since the coughing major. Do you remember the coughing yeah, major? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, if you actually watch that, it's, it's unbelievably like. You're like, so how, how did that ever happen? <laughs> um, and if he quit like a half a mil, he would have got away with it probably. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you're suddenly back in that music and it suddenly super takes you back. Yeah. And I think that can be more evocative than pop music at the time because pop music's constantly recycled and it, it loses its moment of that. And I actually think if you do like a TV thing that has that kind of reach, that can be, you know, have that, that weird impact on people's lives that they don't know about. So how did, you, how did you guys actually start out? I was making like weird electronic music in my bedroom with a four track and a tape player. And I would just go to like, kind of like raves, but more chill out sort of things and just give people cassettes, stuff I'd done. And then I met a director, weirdly sort of, who'd heard my music through that. And he asked me to do a TV show. And it was just that weird thing of like getting people to know. I think if you're starting out, you let people know you're doing stuff and you want to do things. And I think if you just go and do stuff rather than say, hey, I really want to do I want to, you know, I want to be a TV composer. Just give me a job. If you just go and make music, here's some music, and they might go, "Hey, this is really cool and it's different." And actually, you know what? I'd like to use this on my show. Can I use it? And you're like, "Yeah, sure." I think that's a better way to go than just be inundating. Here's my CV. Uh, you know, I'm, I've got this degree. I think just go and make music. And if you made some cool music, someone will want to hear it and go, "I want to use that." And it's very hard. I know it's very hard to get into the industry. It's again, it's like that party with the guy outside not letting you in. But once you're in, you can kind of hold it together, then you'd be okay. But it's that hardest thing is getting in. And I think also when you, if you're feeling down, that kind of like nothing's happening, all that time you've got is like prep time to yeah, like learn everything. Like 
everything you're doing, you're learning. So the more you can learn before you get that break. Because once you get that break, you've only really got it once or twice. And you've got to be ready to like super run at that point. Well, that's exactly the, and it's exactly the same for me in terms of... Uh, so I won a song competition. Uh, it's called BBC Song for Christmas competition. I think that's right, a song. And uh, I was 16, 17 or something. And before that, I'd always been writing music. Again, doing the same as you, kind yeah. of just weird electronic stuff with shortwave radio and I used some shortwave radio, yeah, baby yeah, yeah, alarms. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, no. fed, I, I fed had, stuff through baby alarms. I used, to get, I used to get late seventies. Uh, you know, you used to have the little electronic games with little handsets and yeah. things that made weird noises. I used to do those into a little four track. And anyway, so then I did this song competition, and I met uh, one of the engineers. Went on to become a director, and so when he went to become a director, he needed some cheap music. I'd gone to um, music college and written some music. He'd heard it, and exactly the same as you, basically said, if we give you some money, can we use your music that you've written as part of your university course? <laughs> me going, yeah, OK. So he gave me money, used it on this series, and then and that was it. So again, exactly like Daniel said, you've just got to keep writing and keep writing, because this, this is the time when you're finding your voice, finding you, basically. Uh, but when it does hit, when the jobs do start coming in, you've got to be absolutely 100% on the ball because, it's, as, you, as Daniel said, it's your one chance. And if you're there going, oh, I'm not sure whether I can turn this around in a, you know, in three you days' just, time, got you've got to do it. Yeah. You've, absolutely. I mean, on space, uh, yeah. on space just as an example, it, it, was quite, it, was a, it was quite a big series with, with Sam Neill. Yeah. And I look back at how I did that, and I kind of wasn't ready for that step. It came too early for me only because I didn't have the tech in the studio to really make happen. So this was like a, it was a six part prime time BBC series. And I was working, I didn't have a Betamax, you know, a, a, a PCF system. Yeah. So I literally had, I used to get them to send me a VHS and I had a hardware sequencer, no computer sequencer, a hardware sequencer. And I used to start play on the VHS yeah. and try and press play on the VHS and play on my hardware sequencer at the same time. And all the pieces were done in one take because it would be like, can I play? You know, kind of watch it play, and then I'd make a mistake or that. Okay, stop, and that was it. And the time scale I had to turn it around was was ridic ridiculous. It was a short, really short turnaround, and um, but you kind of got it done because you had to. You had to get it done, and I was really unpre underprepared. I think mean, I think that getting it done because you have to is really good as well. I, that kind of yeah, well, you're not. You, you don't. You don't entertain the uh, you don't think imposter syndrome. Do yeah. you? you just kind yeah. of get on with it. Mine was um, I. Did porn music, and that was uh, so. That was my practice for. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> what are all these Christian? Oh. <laughs> Just some research on this film I'm doing. I need to look at some other composers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the production budgets were high, and the fees were good, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. And but I went to school at a comprehensive uh, called Holland Park Comprehensive, and it, the. It was very close. It was the closest school to uh, the BBC TV centre, so all of my mates who went to university, I didn't. When they came back, they got, kind of got sucked into the factory on the hill. And once they heard that I was writing to picture, I guess it's like, to use your analogy, it was like they weren't, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't on the list for the party. They were catering at the party, okay, so yeah. they'd invite me in. Yeah. And it would be like researchers doing a travel program and this, that, and the other. But I guess my first big job, I, I completely agree with you guys about being ready. I really wasn't ready. And they asked me to do this kind of indie guitar track, and I was a keyboard player. And, you know, in the days before kind of resources with sampling and stuff like that, and didn't think to get a guitarist in, so played some individual chords in, sampled it, got absolutely hammered and sang into the microphone, sent this thing off which in those days, sending like a 30-second thing off by e email took about three hours. Woke up on my uh, sofa at the studio and then went, oh, fuck, <laughs> what did I send? Listened to it mm -hmm. and just went, that's so... F it's me drunk singing and really embarrassed about it and rang up my agent and, um, and he went, how did you know? I said, well, no, I'm just ringing to say, can you, can you make sure that we, we retract the submission? Because it was a pitch. He says, no, they just called me. We've got it. And it was two pints of lager and a packet of crisps. Are you joking? Which then ran for oh, <laughs> forever. And the funniest thing was that I sang it in a Cockney accent. It was set in Runcorn. So we got someone uh, from uh, Hobson's. Is it Hobson's Voices? Yeah, Hobson, yeah. yeah. To sing a, a Runcorn accent, which we worked out was like halfway between Manchester and Liverpool. So sing it like Liam Gallagher. And so he sang it. 
But when it went to the second series, I did a little ego check to, just to check they were still using my music. And it came on and it sounded like really kind of unmuffled, like the unmastered version, and then my voice came out. And they'd got the masters and the demos mixed up. So series two of Two Pints Log and a Packet of Crisps has me pissed singing on it. I've never been on my own and blushed with embarrassment, just knowing that I was singing pissed to... You do know that the first thing we're all going to do yeah. is go home and YouTube and Google yeah. <laughs> Series 2. Yeah. yeah. I, had, was, I had something once where I heard a trailer and I was like, oh, music sounds a bit, this is not very good. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck, it's one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did a series where I sent, a, you know, we've all done this though, where you send in the, the, the demos yeah. and uh, then you go, okay, well, I'll go back and redo everything. And the first three episodes of the series all went out with just the demos that they'd not bothered to replace with anything. And they, they were properly, proper demos. This was back in the day when, you know, that was, that's, that's not good. Even now, I think, and it's just recently I worked on, on like, um, I mean, that kind of French, somehow got into this French circle doing French short films and yeah. like low budget films. And I sent some shitty demo, like I didn't have any time and I did a bit of contact guitar because mm -hmm. she wanted something that sounds like well, that puts Neil Young down now, if I say Neil Young. But she wanted yeah. something to sound like Neil Young and Tchaikovsky or whatever. And I put a bit of shitty guitar with contact, and she used it in the film. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, so don't worry, I'm like going to... It was like that. Yeah, 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 yeah like yeah. that, and a bit of... Yeah. Yeah. Real kind of thing. But I'll replace it. And then I said, yeah, I'm <laughs> going to replace it. I'm going to record yeah. a guitarist, you know, like, it's going to sound absolutely amazing. Don't worry about it. And uh, she sent me the, the cue she used, and she said, yeah, no, I like the idea, that's, that's cool. It sounds, it sounds really amazing, actually. And then I went into the studio, got together with a guitarist and everything, sent it again, and she was like, actually, yeah, I don't know what you did, but it sounds, oh, it well doesn't sound as good. Yeah, that's it's why I'm just going to use what you sent the first time. Well, that's like, why you just enough. don't demo. That's the, you know, well, the danger the there stories. happens to me, and I won't say what the, uh, what the production was. I did a big, a big thing, and uh, I said to them, obviously, I'm going to replace all this with a, with a live jazz swing drummer, and did so. And then in the dub, they went, mm, 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 no, we pr prefer the original. Yeah. And when you listen to it, it's the drum solo in Take Take Five, Dave Brubeck, that I sampled. Oh, really? And it's <laughs> so recognisable. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> share with Fred Mayers, to be fair, if I was in Christian. <laughs> and anyone that's watching this, don't go through his entire back catalogue. To... <laughs> really? Wow. It's one of those things you only yeah. need to hear a beat of, and you go, yeah. yeah. The thing is, you will always be asked that it's a sound alike. That's what always gets me and I'm sure it gets all of us is yeah. when you know kind of uh, I'm a production they'll get they'll get guy track love yeah. and they come back to you and they just go we want it to sound like this that place we want we want this track but we want you to do it because we can't afford to pay for it and will you basically do as close as you can to this track and it's that's a, there's an art in itself that is that, yeah. that in is doing a, that such a I mean I try, it's a nightmare. I spent half my life trying to avoid that and yeah. it's like I can see there's a fire about to start there yeah I'm gonna run as fast as possible yeah. and do whatever I can to stop that happening yeah. because once that's locked in yeah. locked in you're I've done, I, I don't do it now in the early days you kind of when you you're not as What's the word I'm looking for? You, you don't have as much say. You know, now yeah. we can turn around and go, no, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. I'll do, you, you know, something you. But in the early days, you kind of go, as we say, you want to do every job, you want to please everyone, you want a good working relationship, and you kind of go, yeah, yeah, I can, I can do that. And it's knowing where that line is. And sometimes you're, you, you're comfortable with that line. It's when they come back going, yeah, can we have it a bit closer? And you're, you're having to go, no, 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 no. And it's only happened once. There was one project I did years ago where, I, again, I'm not going to say what it was, but it's so, you know, it was just so, I had sleepless nights just thinking this is too, too close to the yeah. bone. And it's just. Well, well the difficulty is you're, you're fighting against two things. I mean, in, for example, when you get something like, um, when someone, and it happened to me, someone put Elgar's Nimrod on. And said, "I want something like that, but more emotional." You just go, <laughs> "You fucking ask Elgar to write something like that, write Nimrod again." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but but that's f for two reasons: because it has an emotional and historical resonance in most people who have heard it, particularly if you've lived in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it speaks of a certain certain thing. So that's you know, when they put well-known stuff on, you're fighting against that, which is a nightmare. But the worst thing is when they put something really esoteric on, oh, like yeah. Solaris. Yeah. yeah. I met Cliff the other day, and yeah. I said, I have to th thank you, but also I have to say, I really h hate and love Solaris in equal measure. And he goes, I'm the same. I'm really proud of it, but they keep on temping my, my mm -hmm. films that I'm working on mm -hmm. with Solaris. And it's a nightmare because it's so idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that's a real problem as well with, it's more like film music, 
but that thing where you, they temp, you get to a certain stage, you've done a bunch of scores, they then temp all future work with your work. Yeah. And you end up ripping up yourself off yourself, which oh, I... Yes, <gasps> that's, that's my I've stopped doing it. I stopped doing it about two years ago because I went through a stage of it. It seemed to me like about three years of, I was working with the same team. You will yeah. work with the same teams again and again and again. And they all thought they were saving me time yeah. by temping it with old tracks of mine because I'd worked with them so much. They had, you know, and it just makes your life an absolute misery. It's soul destroying, isn't it? It's just, um, it's a nightmare because you are ripping off yourself. And then inevitably, you end up ripping yourself off so much, you do a full circle. And then in about six years' time, you suddenly realise that the track you're now <laughs> writing is exactly the same well, as you wrote. Really weird, I saw John Power recently, and he was, he was at Abbey doing the new Bourne film. He says, it's really bizarre because they've tempted a lot of this, not just with old Bourne scores, but with scores that have been ripped off by Bourne. Yeah. And they've put it in, and we've now got to like rip those off and make them sound like Bourne, like yeah. in a full circle. It's it, yeah. bad for the gene pool, isn't it? Yeah, it's like musical Newport. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. argument is, all the way along the line with everyone, is basically, do you know what? I wrote the, f the right notes the first time round. They were the right notes. So every note I wrote from this point onwards is essentially the wrong note. So the moment, the moment they kind of get that in their heads... Yeah, that's actually quite a good line. You know, it's true. Yeah. It, right notes the first time round. From this point onwards, it's always going to be wrong notes. So. I remember they took some music of mine and put it on this, children, this nice, moving children's party for this film, not realising that cue they'd taken uh, was from a film where it was a paedophile stalking oh. children. And so for me, it was like so obscene that they'd used... That music, obviously, completely the opposite context. But it is, wow. it's, a, it's an odd business, all of that. I, I did a bunch of pedo dramas. For one stage, I was the go-to guy for pedo drama oh, music. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't much fun. <laughs> Whoa, OK. Yeah. That's good. really depressing. Yeah. yeah, they're good scores, though. They were kind of dark and depressing, but, yeah. you know, not, good, not a good typecast to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you, so what, like, what are you both doing? Like, um, well, we're both in-house composers yeah. for Spotify Audio. Um, for, for the demo stud, so for the libraries that are coming okay. out. And they so do loads. The, the thing is, you can get people to go and quality assure by checking every note. Yeah. But if you don't actually play these things, yeah, yeah. and I mean, that's the whole mm -hmm. secret of Spitfire is, is it's, it's Paul and I yep. being composers, and so you guys use them in action. Yeah, okay. And QA that way, which we still think, you know, we like someone to go through every yeah, sample no, no, and no, check, no, but it is <coughs> is the, the, the playability and stuff. But um, you were at, sorry, remind me, you studying were, you were uh, at Berkeley. Berkeley, in yeah, I went, I was, I was at Berkeley studying one year, okay. uh, film music, mm -hmm. doing a master's there, which is really helpful because I never had worked with an orchestra before. I didn't, right. because I'm coming like from a band. I play in bands and I'm, I'm a pianist, so I don't really. I was never interested, kind of, in film music, or I didn't, kind of, it never occurred. And it was kind of late. I was only like 24. Okay. And it kind of a similar thing happened. I was always composing little pieces on a piano at home and kind of recorded them in kind of a shitty way. And then one, a friend of mine had to do a uni project. And he had to do some, he had some visuals and he heard my music and he was like, ah. Actually, I, need, I just need some music. Can I use this? And I was like, Yeah, of course. There's just kind of pieces like that. So I guess it's a similar thing on a small scale. And then it was that time. It was the first time when I kind of realised, like, actually, that'd be quite cool to kind of write some music for to picture and stuff. And I looked into where I could go and study because I was but it's like, an oh. art. It's, it's not yeah, like exactly. writing. It's not like writing it's normal music. Writing. To it's picture. almost like being in a band. It's, it restricts you a little bit. A lot. So it's like because you have like the same singer, the same kind of instruments, and you you write kind of a similar style most most of the time. But then in film, I feel you can go all over the genre. <laughs> 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 okay, no. Let's see if we get a hat. Yeah, okay. Okay. Can we just uh, semicircle? <laughs> I just need to put this away a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So I was doing a seminar for the when you came over to to work at Air Studios to have this amazing opportunity to work with an orchestra. And I think they'd all, so it was 30 of you? Yeah, or even more, like 35. Yeah, and couldn't really fit them all in my studio, so I had to do it in two settings. And it was really clear from uh, everyone's faces and their, their breath that they'd been on a massive bender the night before. <laughs> and I really wasn't the highlight of the London trip. So it was like really like, 
I don't know if you've ever like gone to. There's a certain age group where where they really don't respond very well. About fourteen, it was like it was yeah. like doing a seminar to a bunch of fourteen year olds. I'm like, what is this tosser talking about? Never even heard of him. Top yeah. Gear, <laughs> and um, and there was just one enthusiastic face in there going. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and, uh, and Oliver liked what we were doing at Spitfire, and you came in. We went. I I bumped into you at was it BAFTA That's Music right. Awards or That's like right. Library Music Awards That's or right, something yeah. like that. I did a very drunk. I, <coughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You had a similar breath like when I. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I, I I moved to London from because I studied in Valencia. That was the the masters of Berkeley. That was one year in Valencia. And I came back to London to kind of get back together with my band and kind of continue playing, but then also try it in film music, you know. And a friend called me up and she said, like, oh, I've got this ticket for a, a Library Music Awards. Do you, you want to go? You know, and I was like, yeah, networking is always good. So I'm just going to go. So I went with my kind of almost last money on my Oyster card. And uh, as I arrived, Christian was just having his speech. And I was like, oh, amazing. Christian is there as well. <laughs> And as he came off the stage, I kind of timed it a little bit so I would kind of bump into him. <laughs> Stalked, uh, I think is the word you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, hey, Christian, I was, I was in your studio, you know, I, I really loved your well, it's sir, and I played your well, it's in the studio. And I kind of, I, I rang the bell on your studio as well before because I went back to the studio to ask for, you know, is there a job? Yeah. But uh, Jess that's, at that's the time. That sounds like stalking. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like yeah. Almost yeah. stalking. Yeah. 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 And, Jess... and I bought a pair of binoculars and looked through your window. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we might switch to red or do you want some more white? No, no, no. I'm okay. Thank I'm you. all right, man. Okay. And uh, Jess at the time said, like, nah, yeah, no, Christian is busy. Christian is busy. So he sent, she sent me away. And so I told you that and stuff. And I asked for, for advice. And then you said, you, you said, like, travel as much as you can. And um, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm trying to find a job Just in London. And it's can. really Tell them the <laughs> Go away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I, kind of, I was a bit persistent. I stayed persistent, you know. And, uh, that's good. And Resistant. I was like, that's I can't amazing. find it. It's hard in London. And he was like, if you want to go into the film music industry, get used to it for the next five to ten years. Yeah. That's what you, what you told me. And then yeah. I was like, and what about you? Do you need an assistant? I just asked. I was like, okay, fuck it. I'm just going to ask. Yeah, good. And you just gave me your email address. And she's like, yeah, okay, send me an email. And I think that, that was when you, had, when you were really busy. And yeah. Yeah. you hadn't had an assistant for a while, but then you got back into composing. And yeah. It was just... One Everything of those kind together. of, I think, Absolutely. lucky moments. And mm -hmm. I was just a little bit persistent, but I think not too annoying. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for getting lucky. And I think there's also, you make your own luck, but Absolutely. there's also lots to be said for getting lucky and knowing when you're being lucky. Yeah. And it's also knowing when you're lucky and when you've got this like, ooh. This here's, is a chance. Here's a moment. Take the opportunity. Yeah. 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 You always got to take the opportunity. There's, I know so many people who have had that opportunity literally just right there. Yeah. And for whatever reason, they either haven't gone for it or missed it or whatever. I think it was Foybern who said um, that he coined the phrase of the inner saboteur. And he, he, his idea was the best way to get back at your parents was to fuck your own lives up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see people just at the point of, of really, you know, doing something or having an opportunity, you know, really, um, really screwing it up, really. And uh, it's, it's very difficult because it's actually quite a small industry. And I think that it's, it's quite easy. And it's not... It's not necessarily about like losing it and and having you know having doing one of your emails or, or whatever. It's it's that thing of just doing an epic fail and then that that kind of gets out. Well, I think and it's I, so much about reliability and yes. like it's all like you're going to be there. I know I can rely on you and I can always rely on someone. Like this, yeah. I have a very small when I'm doing a film and have like orchestrator certain mixes I want to work with, and I always know that they've kind of got my back mm -hmm. and. When you've got that, it's amazing. When you when they suddenly haven't, or that's where the whole thing becomes like you you have to go test every element of the score. Yeah. And you know, work with Andrew, who's my amazing orchestrator for years, and you know, I know he's going to get it done. It's not like is it done yet? Why haven't I got the scores? I know he's going to do a great job. I'll get the scores back. I'll notate. You know, I'll re remark stuff up. But I don't have to freak out because I know he knows that I need them in time. And if he if he can't do them that second, it's because he's trying to have his own life, and you know. And it's the same what we were talking about before is that you've then got to form that reliability for the director. Yeah. So they you've got to have that relationship with them. It goes down the line, but the whole industry in terms of really is, is all about reliability down the chain. Yeah. You've got and to work with people that you trust and are reliable. Yeah, and if they're being like you know, total jerks and like hey, it's it's 
1.30 in the morning and I want that whole queue redone, like, you, you, could, you know, it's good to point out this is completely unrealistic, yep. but I'll but try and do I'll it. I'll do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think people really respond to that. It's difficult, I mean, it's very difficult because you, I think it's important to try and keep a balance of your life. I'm not very good at it, but I think it's so important being reliable when you get work because basically the most valuable thing I have really is my name and my rep, which is based on that. Yep. And that's worth so much more than anything else I've got, really, because people just know it will get done and it will get done well, interestingly, and you know, hopefully it's going to be a relatively painless process. And being truthful, I think, is helpful. I think that we yeah. s you, get, you get so used to being like ducking and diving, and people get a real sense of that because you start becoming nervous because you're, you're being you're not being truthful. And you know, I think that what I often do is I'm truthful, but I'm also reassuring because I go, listen, I, I'm your head of department, and it's my responsibility to to, to let you know if if yeah. if I'm in difficulty. Mm -hmm. I'm not at the moment, but we are. I think we're a week behind, but yeah. I'll catch up. Yeah. And I think that's. I, I had this film I just did. We had like a, uh, you know, I started on the 3rd of August and I had to finish, you know, like we finished it last week and I, there's, there's sort of like seven days where I need to prep everything because if I don't prep the score, the mixes, all this kind of stuff, it's going to end up being a car crash. There's a really complicated score because it wasn't just like tons of orchestral, it was like all lots of weird percussion and, and I was like, y we have to stop at this time. It's like a cruise liner because I've got to turn the boat around and if we don't stop at this, this time yeah. now, you know, and I gave them loads of warning and it got down to like the last day and it was like 11.30 at night, they're in LA and they're like, oh, we just really want this queue changed. And I was like, oh, it's a big queue. And I was just like, you know what, let me just do it and we'll try it out. And if it works, great, we go with that one. If it doesn't, we have to go with that one. And I've managed to pull something out that kind of worked, which even I was a bit like, hey, that was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But they understood, they, 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 because I'd built them up to that point, they understood. And I think you've got to say to them, look, I can do everything you want, and if you really want me to keep doing it, but it's going to have a knock-on effect on everything yeah, else, absolutely. and it's going to affect the rest of the score. And sadly, I think a lot of being a successful composer is kind of working out how you sell ideas or communicate the realities. You know, the reason you don't want to do something is because you think it's not going to be good. And you sh it's always better to say, I can do that, but it, I don't think it's good for the film, not for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to do something for your own personal ego, then they're not going to really care. But if you're doing something you think is going to affect the film or the show or the, the story, then you should always explain it in that way because that's what all they really care about. They, well, that's all they can <coughs> relate to at the end of the yeah. day because they don't really understand what we do. Essentially, you know, most most directors and producers don't understand what we do and how we do it and the importance of what we do. Yeah, and I don't think that's ever going to change. I think that's just. So if you take on a project, um, what are the is there any rules that you kind of discuss in the beginning of? before you uh, start a project to with make the sure director yeah oh i have yeah i have long conversations with directors in terms of what how much they can push you or how much um, so how many retakes they can do or redo how many times i think you can say it but you just you ignore it that i think you can say nothing. nothing you can nothing. say it but i think once you're on it you just have to be on it to the end and if they're a yeah. nightmare you're like i'm like i've had certain people who've been you know over my career very difficult and you're just like, I will do this job amazingly well, but next time I get the phone call, I'm probably not going to be here. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't tell them that. No, no, of course. But that's the thing. If, you, if you're a pain in the ass, then some people are not going to want to work with you again. And there's, there's whole companies I won't work with because I didn't like how they treated composers. And I'd just be like, yeah. And they come up and they'd be like, this is like years down the line. And I'd be like, yep. yeah, I don't want to work with them. We've all got, I mean, I've, I've got companies exactly the same as that. that I mean, but you... As, as Daniel said, you don't tell them. You basically have to, because it's all formed on this kind of pyramid of making relationships with directors and producers and editors. And, uh, and so what you do is you always, always, if you can, see it through to the end, even if they are an absolute mm. pain. You always see it through to the end. Once you've done, you then basically just put them on the list of never work with them again. And often you'll get an email from a producer going, listen, I know that you had an absolute nightmare on this. Absolutely. Um, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll get you on the next thing. And that, that has absolutely happened to me. I think the one thing that I found very interesting and I've had a bit of a personal kind of study in is, is narcissism because they're, they're very common in the real world, but in our industry, they're, 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 they're everywhere. And I, I think particularly with uh, directors, often they attract very high-functioning narcissists. And I think there's certain things that you should always really watch out for where someone 
is in a position of power, really strove to be in a position of power. Anyone, I think, who, who yearns power is quite an interesting character. And I think that you have to understand how you make them feel that they're in power, but actually you're, you're in control. Actually, it's, it's often a control issue. So there are little things that I would really recommend is often when you're talking about a project, it's really difficult talking about music. And who's it said it's like dancing about architecture? But it's, I think that what tends to happen with me and the mistakes I've made in the past is you run out of things to say because you're just like talking, you're waffling about music and you hear what's coming out of your mouth and it sounds really poncy. So often I will use an example of what we won't, I'll tell you what we're not going to do, we're not going to make it sound like this. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, we'll never ever make the mistake of doing that. If they're a narcissist, they will take what you've said and use that as a bat to hit you around the head with. And the thing I always want to say is, if you don't want to stay up worrying about a project all night, don't tell them what gives you nightmares because they'll often feed, feed into that. I think a lot of us have been in relationships where you'll say, this is my least favourite thing, and someone will go, you, you're or you've done your least favourite thing, as a means of knowing that will get under your skin. And I think it's little tricks like that. Things like, if they are slightly narcissistic, things like saying um, when they've given you a note and you've done like 18 versions and you're recording the orchestra the next day, don't send it saying final version because it just they're going, no, it's not the final version. I will be the judge of that. Yeah. It's, don't, as opposed to just being honest and going, listen, we're, we are running out of time, as opposed to you know, making these, those kind of declarations. So I think it's learning those tricks of the trade. And it's very difficult to understand working with narcissists until you've been through it a few times. I'm not saying don't work with narcissists. Yeah. Uh, and it's not necessarily narcissists or people who are narcissistic, but it is, it is that you, you get some really complex personalities. I guess it's very much like a people, people skills, no? Is it oh, like completely. It involves business, a lot of like psychology. You. Completely. I mean, there, there are people I know who are actually really good composers, but they don't get lots of work because they don't have that you were saying earlier that kind of personable easy to work with because i'm not saying they well, make the life difficult you are, probably the harder it is because you're like i'm such yeah. a good composer that i i know how complex this piece of music is yeah. i don't want to pull it apart absolutely Whereas if you're like hey it's just the two chords like exactly chords, well, that's right? it also yeah don't get ideas of your station don't <laughs> know your position but you know it's it, but it is you know i know i know we provide a service we'd love to think that we kind of make and shape the entire film but realistically we're providing a service to the director. I think, you, and no, the, I think you, know. you can. I think you've got to stick up for what you think. I think the well, great directors, it's fine, okay? It's fine. Balance. Yes. Sorry, the great directors will understand and appreciate what you can bring to a project. But they will push you. The great directors yeah. will push you. Murph, for example. Yeah. You know, is a fantastic. You know, fantastic director. Uh, Nick, 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 Nick Murphy. Murphy. Do you know Nick Murphy? Yeah. yeah. You still work with him a, yeah. a lot. Nick Murphy is a fantastic director. And he will always take one and always just push you that extra little, well, how about, or why don't you try thinking about? And you inevitably, when I've worked with him before, it's always the little bits that he's kind of pushed you over what you were comfortable with that have always come back with you thinking when you, in hindsight, when you listen back to it, you think they were the best bits. You know, yeah, they he, were the bits that really made he's it. He's a really good director, Nick Murphy. Uh, yeah. I started with him years and years ago on this show called The Wardian Country House, which is interesting as well, because my first orchestral score, no idea what I'm doing. And what you were saying earlier, I was just like, yeah, I, I can do that, I'm going to do an orchestra. No idea what I was doing. It just, that's probably one of the scariest moments of my career, is just being thrown headfirst into something. And this was before samples were any good, you know, it's just... And then I learned, I just, by doing and being totally shit scared, I learned how to do an orchestra, and it kind of worked out quite good. And I did my first, he was the guy who took me into the party, into the yeah, film really? party, and he stuck up for me. <coughs> and he had some really good composers who could have done that film, and he, he chose me, and that was a... And he's a really good, understand, he really understands music. And so that's someone who's been very special in my career, going through, just working with, because I know we always do really good work. And the film we did, The Awakening, is probably still one of my favorite things I've yeah, done. It's a brilliant film, great school. Absolutely. So yeah, it's finding those good people, but they're hard to find. Yeah, but when you do find them, that's the thing, when you do find them, yeah. they make a difference. Yeah. And you hold on to them. Yeah, yeah and also you, get, you then have a benchmark you then go oh hang on you can look back and go hang on that actually that actually wasn't my fault that that thing that well that's the thing if you don't if you don't have that benchmark you can come away from every pro project thinking god you know every, every single job i do is a pain in the ass and everything's really difficult and you know 
And it's when you then go, well, no, it, actually, it isn't. It isn't. Can't just be me because I've worked on with so and so, so and so, so and so. Who've made life really easy. Yeah. So, but I think you're right. It's finding that that way of communicate. It is it is finding a balance with, between being if you're completely subservient that they, they don't respect you for that no, either. No. And you know you watch look at the other heads of department, the the, the, the sound editor, the the, the the picture editor. They will always there will be a point that they'll hold their ground. And I know two tremendously successful composers, and one is is not doing as well now because they they just held their ground too much and just went fuck you. It's five o'clock in the evening. I'm 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 done. And one person um, would basically do exactly the same thing, but what he'd say would be uh, the way that you're communicating with me doesn't really work. So I suggest you go away, come back, and have a little think about what you really want me to do, and uh, and then we'll talk again about it tomorrow. And that's uh, just a kind of a much more Interesting, yeah. respectful. Let's try to put a positive slant on it rather yeah. than it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You just you're you're not having a good day. Mm. And in fact, you know, going back to that documentary, the the second time that documentary filmmaker we were talking about, that second time I was fired, I walked in as he was screaming at his entire mm. two two, <laughs> and it was like you are there is a frame of mind to listen to to, to music. And this is not the frame of mind. I don't care how good my music is. I don't think you're going to find it very good. You're going to find it frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be what you've imagined in your head, which you don't even understand. And it's, I think it's understanding those bits of kind of uh, people management and going, let's do this. And I'll another come back time. tomorrow. Let's do this another time. Now I've got yeah. some really exciting stuff, but now it's not the time. And yeah. you know, working out how to do it. I can't say that I really have succeeded in that 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 that, that respect. But it is, you know, it was great to talk to that that uh, that successful composer who said you know to a big director you're, you're not communicating with, with me well mm. enough have a little think about what you want Interesting. I, re I remember that time talking about people business when i was working for you and there was this director coming in and you were like um let's make him some tea and bring bring him a lot of cookies because when he adds tea and cookies he's going to give me better feedback there you go. <laughs> so we got him a nice bowl of cookies yeah, and absolutely. a nice tea yeah. like we dimmed the light a little bit like Abs nice chair it's and not, everything was it a date are you sure you're not confused <laughs> 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 this, sounds, this doesn't sound like a gig this sounds like a date so what like in like have you been doing yeah, so what, what yeah. film and what tv stuff you? for uh no only uh one um, thing for oh, yeah, was a Channel 4 days. thing. Um, a friend of a friend. Actually, you've been writing the score for a film that my friend is in. Okay. Her boyfriend. Oh, yeah, okay. He's the a mermaid. writer. He's a, okay. Yeah, he writes scripts. And he asked me if I could um, do a little uh, short film for him. It was a Boris Gary film. It's kind yes, of it a the short film about four minutes long just before the real movie starts around Halloween last year. Was yeah. Um, so that was my first um, writing to picture. Yeah. picture. And? Uh, yeah, I absolutely loved it. You've studied, haven't you? Um, yeah, I, I did. You don't need study. to study, though. I don't think it's like I didn't. Well, this, is the, I mean, this yeah. is the next yeah. question, really. I think. Uh, well, I started off playing um, violin for a few years, and then started singing in a jazz band, and then doing also some piano. Um, that was in Vienna. And then I came over to finish school in, in England. Yeah. Um, and there, it was there that we actually were given a task to write some music for an image, because I was doing uh, music technology, and these kind of subjects don't even exist in Vienna, maybe by now, but not back then. Um, and there was opening a whole new um, subject for me that I wasn't even aware of that you can do. Or, um, so being made aware of that, I completely fell in love with that little task and just trying to write something. Um, didn't study too much theory then, so it was all trying to come up intuitively or just pulling my ears back then. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought I, I would like to do that, pursue um, music, um, did a degree in music performance and uh, production. Wasn't quite happy with it. Or I, I wanted to study more, but it was just financially not really feasible yeah, okay. to That's to continue. So I went to uh, Spitfire, and knocked on the door, and What's said, the "There's a lot of knocking on the door at Spitfire." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I came over there and started as an intern, and then yeah, trying to slowly oh, work my way into writing. Yeah, starting off with demos now, and yeah, yeah. And absolutely love it. Oh, that's it's fantastic. Great. You st so you studied. I studied. Yeah, right. I did. Did the you, you genuinely did you think 
is it, has it been of use? For me, completely. Yeah, for me. But yeah, wait, I'm not study. saying don't study. No, no, but no, I'm no, just no, saying. No, no, no. Never study, never read no, anything. Yeah, no, no, you won't no, study, no, but no, I'm no, just no, saying it's like one of those things where it's not like this thing where you, ha an end you have to have a degree no, 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 before no, you become no, a no, composer. Yeah, your background no, nowadays no, doesn't really seem to matter that much because it, everything seems so available. Absolutely. And You're completely right. For me, I mean, the thing is, I knew, I mean, we've had this conversation, but I mean, I knew when I was 11 what I wanted to do. And so uh, it was kind of always going to be what I did. And so. Um, but I specifically, so I was, I was already writing loads of stuff when the whole thing about going to university came up. And so I deliberately went for somewhere that the stuff that you hate, in other words, all the avant-garde, all the real, you know, kind of weird and wonderful stuff, I studied somewhere that specialised in that for the simple reason that up until that point, I was basically writing glorified Rachmaninoff stroke Debussy stroke late romantic kind of stuff, combined with Electronica because I was really into... Sounds pretty good. Mid-80s, mid <laughs> you know, early mid-80s uh, electronic bands. And so that, that kind of combination, and I thought, uh, so I specifically went for somewhere that specialised in doing the stuff that I said, I'm not saying I hated it, but I saw it as a challenge. Because I, my argument was, in my head was, if I can uh, learn that and get what I want out of that, it can only make what I do better and broaden my horizons. So I basically had three years of really studying very contemporary, very kind of avant-garde. Wow stuff which then obviously rubbed off slightly on my kind of late romanticism and that's kind of when you know we all we all talk about when the point we find our voice and the only time we can really find our voice is if someone turned around and said write an album write whatever you like that's when her real voice comes out um but i found my voice then and that kind of did everything for me just but it was that combination of the um Devon Guard stuff. but the the studying in terms of orchestration and writes for orchestra and all that kind of thing it, I mean, it's, it's served me well, it's, you know, it's done me well. And, but you're right, it's not the be-all and end-all. You can do it a million and one different ways. But, lovely, thank you. But for example, at the moment on the project that I'm doing, the one we were talking about with, with a full orchestra, the fact that, you know, I, I just kind of know because I've studied it all. I studied it all, you know, 30 years ago. So I know exactly what can do what and what will sound good with what, not just based on samples, not just based on what I'm hearing, I just know before I start how to orchestrate <coughs> straight off. So, which do, it's just it makes life easier. That's all. But it's not essential. It just makes life easier. Mm. But for me, the enjoyment thing is for me is the most important thing because I mean we we sit here and we moan about it, but the reality is, if we didn't actually enjoy it, mm. we wouldn't be doing it. I mean, I always use the line, you know, genuinely. I honestly think, although I have no sleep, I have no life. I'm just, you know, it's Let just work, work, and work, and work. I honestly think I've got the best job in the world. I do, and um, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, really. Although more sleep, obviously, <laughs> and a life. But other than that, you know, and the other reason you work very hard, I find, is because you know how lucky you are, basically, oh, to have a job where you just make noises for a living. Absolutely, you and I would be doing this whether we were paid or not. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell anyone else that. But <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's but true. There's a thing where it's like you respect what you have, mm -hmm. so you don't want to. You like. I'm going to work so hard to make sure this never goes because absolutely, this is a very cool thing to do. Yeah, I am the luckiest man on earth. You know, I get it with Spitfire a lot. But I, I always say that I decided to be a film composer when I was five. And deepest, the, the route that I took, you'd think it was that every wrong turn towards that that goal. But I do actually have a five-year-old now, and he's in no position to make career choices. Yeah. And I think there is this kind of obsession with, I've been wanting to do this since I was five, therefore I have to honour that. And I'm really glad I have, and I've really, really enjoyed it. But I've also equally, I think, just going back to what you were saying, Dan, Dan, Daniel, something I've just loved about composing is making sounds. Mm -hmm. That's the fun, that, for me, is the, the real fun bit. And so be, being able to set up uh, Spitfire and kind of monetize just one bit of what I do and not worry about arguably the really difficult bit which is making music mm -hmm. has, has also been a pleasure and I think that, that keeping an open mind I know a lot of music very successful music editors who wanted to be composers and they're hugely successful music editors mm -hmm. and, and conversely I know music editors who are going into composition and I think that kind of keeping an, an open mind I think that it's funny when you when you have discussions at careers level at school and stuff it tends to be a very um, a, a black and white kind of approach to show business so you'd say I want to go into films then go directing or acting it's like 
Well, have you ever, ever watched a credit roll at the end? There's a lot more oh, yeah. jobs than than that, and I think there's a lot more jobs within the, the, the music industry. That um, I mean, I got laughed at when I was, you know, careers advice about wanting to write music. For, I mean, they told me I should be a hairdresser. I wanted. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was literally that when you turn around and say I want to write music for. Again, it's that it's that sense of yeah. But when that fails, mm -hmm. I mean, I I basically had a, a, a girlfriend at the time. In, in sixth form, whose mother basically just made it very clear that there was no point with her staying with me because I'd never, I, would, I wanted to write music for a living, and so that was, <laughs> that was shocking. <laughs> what, what, well, when he fails miserably, what's his real job going to be? But if you do something you really love, then oh. it's not really a job. You win whatever the Absolutely. money is, and then you're going to work so much harder yep. at what you do because you really care about it. Yep. And I mean, I think what's what I think is fascinating about Spitfire is you made all these like really interesting things. You're, you're like, let's try what it's like with 16 mandolins or whatever, which no one else has really done. And mm -hmm. so you're trying like some of the most innovative recording stuff at the moment, which well, no yeah. one else is doing, which is kind of exciting, right? Well, like, that was born out of being presented with a... Um, what's the name of Thin Red Line uh, director? Terence Malick. To, uh, so many directors want to be Terence Malick. So there was just a long barley shot with the, the wavy yeah. barley. It was for the go-between. And I looked at that and I thought, that something that's so kind of entrenched in the go-between is the sense that it's a really hot summer in England. And how would I represent that? Yeah. And that's where having the company um, and, and actually working to picture, I think, when it, when it really pays off. As you go, I've got an image here. And I'm imagining mandolins and charangos, but loads of them, like like you know, blades yeah. of, of barley. And I think that is um, that that's that that does pay off. And that's why I continue and I love composing, but why I continue to do it because I think that um, I think that uh, being at the coalface is very important. You can't, I don't think you can just cook up sonic concepts without having some application, really. Well, I certainly am so used to having mm. ha having something to apply it to. But um, yeah, and I think that's something that um, that I also enjoying is is creating sounds that I uh, 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 can inspire, and I think that because it's so difficult when you're really got the white screen and and you know you don't know to be able to go to places. I've always built little like speaking to you, built yeah. little sound. You just know you can go there and something yeah, will fall completely. out of your fingers. And I mean the that's... Evo Grid idea, like, that's just genius. Absolutely. Well, I think it's because that's. That's got a play. Like, I don't like things that are too presetty. Whereas that's got an interesting. You never quite know. Yeah. I mean, I just I'm king of the random on, on all yeah. the Evo grids. King of the random, and I sit there and I will just keep playing it until something is interesting. And um, the problem I've been having with this orchestral thing is when when I've been I've just got the orchestral palette or the full thing, and then I've and each section I've got a you know kind of an Evo. Yeah, it's it's and I'm sitting there and, and, and I'm, 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 I'm there and they're playing something going, this sounds really interesting and then I listen back to it thinking now I've got to make a real orchestra to exactly <laughs> yeah. this. Now. But um, no it's all that kind of you know as you say it's the inspiring stuff that and it doesn't have to be big you know a lot of the stuff that inspires us is quite small mm. intimate you know so um, yeah. So would you say that the times have changed since you were I guess so. I've sort of been quite lucky. I've sort of managed to surf this thing while everything else, and sort of so I've stayed level. Yeah. While jobs, money disappears, and, and would you have any advice to people trying to? If break I was starting it? out now, I would be looking at. I think going back to what I said a second ago is about trying to. At the end of the day, all you, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. If you can do something where you can make music and turn that into a living, that's kind of really what you want to do. And. I actually think there's such an explosion in stuff like online content, um, sort of weird appy games and stuff like that. If I was starting out, I'd probably be trying to look at that more. Yeah. Because everyone's got these videos and everyone needs music. And if you could actually find people who care about interesting music rather than just wall to wall filler, and even if they just want wall to wall filler, just make some the coolest wall to wall filler that, that, that you can. And that's also interesting. If someone says, like, hey, I want something that's like a bit bland and offensive, you're like, well, how can I make the greatest music? You know, because there are, there are great tracks that do that. And I'd be looking at that and trying to find, you know, these kind of new areas where people don't know what they're doing so much. And that's, you know, all the great work always comes from, you know, great cinema was the time when it's making loads of money and no one understood why. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that's the kind of, the sort of, TV's got weird because it's become so corporatized. And once something becomes corporatized, all they care about is like, this is the formula. And yeah. here's the money, and it's not very much, and we don't really care about music anymore. Whereas these other areas, it's still in flux. So that's what I would, but yeah, I would just, that's what I'd probably be trying to do now, if I was starting out. Just finding an avenue to make, you just want to find an avenue. Even like the sampling thing is really interesting, just building sample instruments. That's something you couldn't have done years ago. Well, not made a not made a business like no 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 yeah, yeah but you yeah, making make a business yeah, yeah but you couldn't have done it really years ago because you, the equipment was not yeah no, it was yeah it wasn't there it was just loops it was just like well I can sell you some loops but that's not very interesting whereas now you can make proper weird instruments and because the internet you can sell them it's like you know I think that's fascinating as well these kind of you know like Spitfires like the Biggie but there's lots of other people just making weird little yeah. bespoke noises. Yeah, it's like um, Pendle Pouch. Oh, that's a massive, massive. Yeah. Just, he, he gets me out of so many holes. I'm just, and he's like, you know, I'm just well, I've got a free afternoon. What am I going to do? I'm going to do something really creative with this. And just put the sustain pedal down on top of a piano and put something on top of it. And no, it's 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 a real kind of um, you get a real sense of adventure out of it. If, do you have a, a, a advice that you would in this day and age? Because it's a, a different landscape. It is a different landscape. And you know what? I don't. I don't really, as I said to you a minute ago, I don't really know what what I would do if I was in your position because I just kind of not fell into it. But I think you've just, I think you've got to what we were saying about you've got to just remember how lucky you are that if you can make any money, any money whatsoever, doing what you love doing, you're lucky from day one. And if and that's just you earn, you know, a couple of grand a year whilst you're doing other stuff, you've got to be thankful for that couple of grand. Because at the end of the day, there was a lot of time when you couldn't, you know, you either couldn't earn any money doing it, or you'd be really lucky, like we did, starting at a time where we went through times where we earned, could earn loads of money doing but it. I think, but I think there's always been. You've got to have the passion. Though. All That's through the time, there's always been problems and something changes. Yeah. So it's always, always like you look at now, there's a whole new world of like media that never existed when yeah. we started. So go for more that. points yeah. of sale for music than there's ever been. And. There are definitely avenues to do interesting stuff. Yeah. And, you know, stuff I've done on video games is way more popular than stuff I've done on TV because people play it all the time. And it's it's just finding different different avenues and not, you know, trying to think fresh ra rather than like outside the some, box. Yeah, just thinking like this is what yeah. I want to be. It's like be, be your own person and discover what it is what you But I, I would I would still say that from for for me, is the fact that do do I sit down every day and write exactly what I would want to write? And I think the, the answer for that is no, a lot of the time, no. I don't write exactly what I would like to write in an ideal world because, I, you know, as you well know, I've been talking forever and a day about getting this, you know, doing a proper album where I've got no constraints, so just do what I want. And uh, I, again, as I've said, I know lots of really great writers and great musicians and great composers who keep saying, oh, I'd love to write for TV. But then there's an art to writing for TV and film. And it is an art. It's not just sitting down and writing music. Because I know great musicians that write great music. But if you gave them a moving image, or you, they wouldn't know where to start. And I think, for me, it's, I very much differentiate this as what I do is, is a job. And it's, it's an art that I'm, you know, can, we can do quite well. And I'm just really lucky that I'm making a living still writing music. But the reality is, if you tur got rid of all of that and then turned around and went, okay, here's your here's your check, write an album, you know, take a year out and write an album, that would be my utopia. Yeah, but then you wouldn't know what to do. I, I, no, well, yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> that's I think I think the best yeah. thing about TV and film and all these kind of jobs is there's a a restriction on like and, you have to, and I think having no I've got a weird record that I've been making for years that I kind of do behind the scenes yeah. and it's taking so long because it's like it's got to be absolutely perfect whereas with TV stuff it can be a bit more disposable and I still want it all to be great yeah. there's deadlines and sometimes that disposability and that speed with which stuff has to be done forces you to write write stuff that could actually be way better than something you labour over for years. You're right. I think the one thing we haven't mentioned in all of this is deadlines. And I think that is, that's the one thing that is the, that's the kind of defining factor, really. Because the, you, what you also have to accept when you do this is this, you know, as I keep saying, I don't want to keep saying it's a job, no, but it is, it is a job. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you know, I'm sure a lot of people starting out think that we sit there 
and just go, oh, well, the muse hasn't got me today, so I'm just going to go fishing or I'm going to go you know, do whatever. Like Kristen does. Well, yeah, like Kristen does. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> really quite a hard work. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but you know what I mean? That, that thing about the muse, that yeah. it, it doesn't exist. It exists when you have no work on. It exists when you have no work on. You wake up in the morning going, I've got nothing to do, you know what? Yeah. But the reality is, once you're actually working and this is a proper job, you're waking up at, you know, you hardly get, well, I hardly get any sleep. You don't get a lot of sleep. You get up, and whether you're in the mood or not in the mood, you know, you have to just literally be able to turn it on like that. It's like a tap, you have to turn it on. And a lot of the time, that is a real, really difficult in itself, just to be able to just turn on cue. I mean, for me, and I have to, I said this to you before, for me, I have two heads, which is basically autopilot head and creative head. And I try to use creative head as much as I possibly can. But every now and again, I will wake up on a Friday morning knowing I've got to you know, churn out 10 minutes by 5 o'clock that afternoon. And the only way you can do it is literally autopilot head. And when, you go into, and when I go into that mode, it means that everything I do will fill the space, it will do the job, it will do the... But it is literally almost like writing by numbers. And what will come out is we'll be fine and we'll do the job. I think the sad part about it, as we were you know, talking, hinting on earlier, is when you do that, you do autopilot head, and the director's turning around and going, God, this is the best bit of the entire film, this is fantastic. But is and it not difficult then with yourself that you feel like, ah, oh, I wish I Absolutely. would have done something else. I, I wish, wish I would have like put a bit more time and yeah. I recorded a weird sound and it was mine. Absolutely. But it, it means that it's, it's that you've got to... It's at that point it feels like a job. It feels like, a, you know... Yeah. I mean, therein, I think, lies probably the common thing, is, is, is you've got to enjoy writing music. And I think it, in, in, in order to enjoy writing music long term, you've got to make music that really satisfies you and that is, is you. Yeah. And I think um, because there will be times where it is, it is a, a hard slog, but provided you're writing music that's stimulating you, I think is that, that's Stimul important. Yeah. And that's something that you've, you've all, always you know, done, I feel, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that, you know, I think that if you go into this aping other people, um, and being another person who writes in using ostinatos and things like that, um, I think that further down the line you'll get to a point where you'll feel very much kind of lost at sea because, well, what, what's the enjoyment in this? So it's always finding, and speaking again to Cliff Martini's recently, you know, I said, steel drums, space, why? He goes, well, I was interested in learning how to play steel drums, and I always have a policy of whatever is my new toy, I'll just push it into that, that, yeah. that, that. That the, the film that I'm working on, and um, and you know, and uh, therein lies the friction. There creates the tension. How do I turn a Caribbean instrument uh, that people play on beaches into the void of space? And mm -hmm. how brilliantly he did that. And the other thing is, you know, I think a lot of people get into it genuinely because of, and this is common throughout the music industry, get into it because of the glamour and you know, selfies on. Oh, on yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. glamorous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and actually, it's, it's just <laughs> it, it, it isn't. <laughs> And I had an assistant who was, you know, who was like this, this king of a certain area, and you know, and it was selfieing and look what I'm doing, look at the red carpet I'm on, and all of this stuff. But then when he saw the work involved, it was like, is this really what it is? And it is, yeah. And if you don't enjoy the music that you're making, you're not going to enjoy. No, it's, yeah, you're the absolutely job. right because there are times when I'm sure you're exactly the same. You will get to the stage where you're sitting there thinking, oh God, you know. It's now four o'clock in the morning. I've got to come up with a new theme. I've got to do this. And really, am I doing this? But you know, you have to then balance that with the times when you know, you've just come up with the most amazing theme. And you, you, know, you know quality when you. you yeah, know. my best bit is always yeah. when I'm at home and I've done something. And that's like, I'm on my own. Yeah. I have always moments in my flat when I'm just at own. And I know I've created something that's really special. Yeah. And it could even get. That <coughs> feeling is. <coughs> that's best. Even if the director later goes, I don't like it. Yeah. And you're like, but. They can never take that moment away. And Absolutely. I can remember moments I've done that where I've just sat and I've just been like, oh, wow, this is really great. This is, like, really exciting. I always say I love Morricone. You look at Morricone's work. He just churned stuff out when he was uh, early on, which I call the Morricone principle, which was, like, do it as much as you can, as fast, you know, just take everything on, just work, 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 do everything good. And, you know, his scores, some of them are okay, but most of them are so fantastic. Even the ones you know he just, you know, you can hear that month when he churned out three scores, they all sound the same, mm -hmm. same instruments in the same way. Yeah. I've bought some steel drums, I've put those on it. But they're brilliant and he creates works of art that would never exist if he wasn't 
having that work ethic. And you actually look at his artistic work, his applied music, and for me that doesn't have the emotional connection I have to his other stuff. What I find far more inventive and it's interesting that aspect of the industriousness and the deadlines and just creating that forces you to create things you would have never thought. And I think when you think about what you want to create, sometimes it's such a scary, just do huge, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's just like, don't think about it, just do it. Yeah. yeah. Says the guy who spent 10 years trying to finish this album. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is template, just come from a tech point of view. I, I, always, I always have a new template. Yeah, per, it's a new thing for me. I've, Every per, gig now, I'm doing a new template. Yeah, exactly. So so makes, I, I, I never know what my template is until I finish it. I build it as I go. I have no idea what yeah. it is. No, well, I made it probably about five years of using probably one template and just found myself falling into uh, the I, same musical that's concepts. That's, yeah. that's what I teach you at, at college. Yeah, like you, 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 must have a, a you must have a template. No. No. And I quite... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah well, this... <laughs> Throw it out of the room. Like. For me, I, I have two. I basically have normally two days at the beginning, very beginning of a project. Normally two days where I sit down. It, it, norm, that do you know, requires not, confidence, though. Well, not other, other time. It's not a completely blank. I almost start with the template, which is the template, and then I sit there, take out, add, replace. You know, and I spend two days of just messing and trying to get my head around it. But it means that every every project I start has a new template, and a lot of it maybe, and a lot of it maybe with new toys. A lot of yeah. it with new libraries or new ideas or new whatever, but it's like it then for me, it then forms the sound of, of that project, of that, project, yeah, of that yeah, series. And some yeah. some of my templates for some projects really have minute templates, and then other ones are the normal ones with you know. But but it's that we you know. It doesn't always those. need to be huge yeah. either. The templates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I start with the reverb because I always know I'm going to use masses of that. And I just <laughs> see what fit with that. <laughs> yeah. Have you tried that new adaptive? I don't know, I'm not going to go <laughs> off Brilliant stuff. Well, I think it's been absolutely fantastic and fascinating and, yeah. Very I mean, just the, the thing probably to end on is that I, I do, I do on occasion hear stuff that's very samey that people are trying to, and we talk about getting your own voice. It's not a very easy thing to do. I don't know if I've got there yet personally, yeah. But do you have any thoughts on fi finding a voice? Well, I got, um, I kind of f fell into mine, and it was, you know, I can literally just place it down as much. It was, as I said, Rachmaninoff, Debussy, late Romanticism, Stroke, Avant Garde, Stroke, Electronica, Stroke, all of those, throw them into the mix, and a bit of Steve Reich here and there, yeah. and something kind of came out the end. But I, I was really lucky. I found mine really early on, and you know, I mean. I, it's, it's good when you find your voice because, you know, when people turn around and they can watch something and they'll go, well, I knew it was you before it gets to the credits. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the time, you know, I used to take that as what, what you're basically saying is everything I write sounds exactly the same, which I'm sure there's some of that in it. But for me, you're thinking, well, no, that's, 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 a, that's a good thing. And I kind of, be, I went through a stage of really trying to go, no, no, I'm bored with my voice, which we've all been there. We've all been the I'm bored with where I am. And I was bored with my voice and suddenly thought, okay, I'm gonna go off here. And it's only when you start to go off and you suddenly realize that, do you know, all I'm really doing is fighting against the tide. All I'm really trying to do is trying to be clever and go somewhere else for the sake of go, being clever and going somewhere else. And then the moment you kind of steer back again, it suddenly all makes sense again and becomes easier. So for me, um, finding the voice for me was really easy and really quite early it's on. It's trusting but your own musical heritage, you have which to. has to be unique. There's no, there's, it's, 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 and you have to have a certain sense of cockiness for, you know, you have to kind of have a belief in, you know, kind of what you're doing. I mean, I did it in my, when I did my whole uni thing, because I was basically saying, no, I'm going to do this. And I, I got crap marks in my first year, and I basically had to, in my second year, prove a point. And I had to go, look, the reason I'm writing like this isn't what you want me to write like, but the reason I'm writing like this is not because I can't write any other way, but it's because this is, I've got such belief in this, this is how I'm going to write. And we came to a kind of deal where they basically said, OK, you do what we want you to do in the second year. And when it comes to your third year, that actually matter in terms of marks and things. You can do whatever you like. And we won't, we won't try and harness you down. So in my second year, I proved that I could write avant-garde and shit and all that kind of thing, which basically meant that in my third year, they just off my back completely and just let me do exactly what I wanted to do. Because by that stage, I had the kind of cockiness to go, this is my voice. This is what I'm going to do, like it or lump it. And I think I still have that now. I still have a kind of, it sounds, it sounds like a, 
as if it can't be true because you're working for directors. But there's still a certain kind of, not arrogance, but there's a certain kind of, this is what I want to do, this is what I believe in, are you, are you in or you're out kind of thing. And I think you need a bit of that. Yeah, you've got you? I, think you, I think you should have loads of that, because I yeah. think you should have, in an ideal you've world, people, people hire you because they want your you. take on it. Yeah. And if they want to water that down, you're like, well, sure, I can do that, but why, you know, you've hired me because you like my other work, hopefully. Yeah. Um, well, often they hire me and go, we tried to get Daniel Pemberton. But it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that, um, I think I, I, whilst I say I haven't found my voice, I have done a couple of films recently where I've just, I've just been myself. And that was that, there's that great saying, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And it is just, I'm just going to make decisions based on my musical heritage, which is, I know it's going to be a, di a different, you know, you and I will like similar things, but... I may like Jimi Hendrix more than you do, yeah. so it'll it'll be balanced in a different way, and yeah, I think that that is. It also massively depends on the project because you yeah. can have like your. I think it's finding that when you can use your voice because it's yeah. like you can have this great voice, but if the project does it doesn't fit the project, then yeah. Like one of my favorite things I did was that show Desperate Romantics, and I got to do like ludicrous, like, over the top, sort of classical rock with like like full orchestra with like band playing like. 70s kind of um, glam rock beats. Yeah. And that's because the characters were like ludicrously over the top cocky idiots. Mm -hmm. And I kind of connected with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, but it's like John Williams' score, Catch Me If You Can, I think it's one of his best. And it's, it's totally not, not idiomatic of, of John. It's, it's Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've just, I just did a, a few months ago, I did a, a, a BBC thing about 1066. And so I was. We, you know, all this kind of historic docudrama stuff that we've all sat there and you know done and gone through, and I just had the conversation, just going, do you know what? What I really fancy is why don't we just do it all electronica, and loads of dirty synths and just lots of distortion and yeah. and loops and all this kind of thing, <laughs> and you could almost see that kind of whoa, <laughs> hang on a minute, but you kind of it's that self belief of just going, no, do you know what? This I can make this work, and I think it's yeah. the I can make this work, and. Again, as Daniel said, you get in there early. That's the thing. You don't let them temp it up with um, traditional kind of docudrama, historic docudrama. Yeah. Yeah. You get in there early and start sending down sketches, and you know, kind of this is the kind of thing we go for. And it's turned out it's, it's worked out really fantastic, school, but completely not what you expect, not what Joe Public expects. Just something that I was just there wanting to do, dirty, distorted electronica. But Joe yeah. Public's up for it as well, that's the thing. The, so much more sophisticated than the, the, than... the only conversation we had to have was at the end, the end credits is like kind of 35 seconds of one note just gradually getting more and more distorted with that's the drum. Anyway, anyway that. next on BBC One. <laughs> <laughs> How will so do do on Great British Bake Off? Yeah. But do you know, it was that it was, and we had to have the conversation just going, you know, are, are the audience up for this? Just one note getting more and more distorted. And um, I'm there going, yeah, I believe in it. Do you believe in it? Yeah, I believe in it. Well, sod them then. Let's go for it. You know, and it's, again, it's all coming down to the having belief. It's having the confidence in your own car salesman again. It's like, this is the best car you're ever going to yeah, buy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really? You think so? Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> it all comes down to they'll turn it down in the dub. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know I have eyes have a badge that says turn it up. <laughs> Do you? That I've worn to a dub once. I actually walked into a dub where the dubbing engineer went, don't usually allow composers in, in my dubs. You're yeah. joking? No, no, big, 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 big dubbing Whoa, guy. Okay. Yeah, but... Uh, what was his... Tell me afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. okay. Cuban heels. Whoa, whoa. What, what did his surname begin with? I can't Letter. actually remember his name. He was, he was at Pinewood and said, I don't usually allow Yeah, I think I know, might know who that is. Yeah. That's, oh, sorry, that's horrendous. That's Shocking, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, well, what are you do? anyway well, brilliant bombshell. stuff. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been thank awesome. You. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank Excellent you for the fine stuff. chefs of the food as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, where are we today? We're at the Riding House Cafe. Are and you like it? And it was, it was like uh, yeah, it was ten percent off if yeah, you mention it. It was delicious. Brilliant. Thank you, guys.